Alex, thank you so much for joining us today and your willingness to be our first person. Yeah. I know that um, we have so much for you to share with us today, so we might as well start um, uh, right away and get into it. Yeah. Alex. Just, just, oh. a second. just before we start, you could see from the picture here that even then I didn't know how to straighten a tie. <laughs> Alex, before we turn to your life during the war and the Holocaust, yeah. let's start with you telling us a little about your parents, your family, and you in that time before the beginning of the war in September 1939. What was their early, your early family life like? Uh, <clears throat> my father and my mother both came from the same little town in the province of what is today the Ukraine. It's Galicia. For people who know Yiddish, we are Galiziana, from Galicia. And uh, my father served four years in World War I, but on the wrong side, with the Austrian army, because that part of the world was Austria. <clears throat> After the war, in 1922, they, she, he moved to France, and then 24 came back uh, to his village and came back with his fiancée, my mother. <clears throat> and in 26, my sister was born. Uh, my mother, as you said, was a trained uh, Hebrew uh, teacher, but she never had an occasion to teach because she had, had to help my father to make a living. And she worked as a seamstress. So. <clears throat> when the two years before the war, my father was a traveling salesman, but being based in Strasbourg, which is far, far in the east, it was not convenient. So we moved to Paris uh, just before the war. Paris was more central, and he could work. It was easier for him. Therefore, we moved. When the war started, we moved to the south of France. Short, uh, short stop at uh, Issoudun, it's a small town. Then more south, where my mother's uncle was since World War I. That's a whole story in itself. I will not tell you that. And Alex, before we turn yeah. to after the war began, a few uh, more questions for you. You mentioned your father had served in the First World War. Mm -hmm. He was wounded. Uh, he saw yeah, the combat he was. and was wounded, wasn't he? He saw my, not only that. My father served in communications. And in these days, World War I, communications was telephone. And to serve in the telephone part, the, mo the most important and uh, dangerous uh, job was to lay lines, telephone lines, and to repair telephone lines. And uh, I think my father told me that uh, it was a very dangerous and very exposed uh, job. And he said that sometimes when you, you put together uh, uh, wires, suddenly you heard the Russians. You heard the Russians because by mistake, you put two wires together which didn't belong. But uh, so the poor man, he, and he was wounded. Uh, and uh, after the war, he came to France actually he came because his elder brother came to uh, Strasbourg before World War, uh, World War I. Now, it's very curious because uh, my, my uncle le uh, left Austria before World War I to come to Strasbourg, which was Germany. And my father left Poland after World War I to Strasbourg, the same town, but it was France. That's a, that was a... So, Alex, World War II, of course, began mm -hmm. with Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland, yeah. September 1st, 1939. Mm -hmm. Two days later, on September 3rd, France and Britain declared war on Germany. Mm -hmm. But for France, the full impact of the war wasn't felt until Germany invaded France in May of 1940. Tell us what you can, if you know anything about that period, 
after the war began officially mm -hmm. in 1939, but before it really was yeah. felt in France, what was that time like for you, yeah. you and your family? Family, I don't remember exactly. That period is still called in history books as the funny war. Why the funny war? There was no combat. The Germans stayed in Germany, the French stayed in France, and, and suddenly, uh, and the French built a very strong fortification on the German side, meaning we know today that they, prefer, they prepared the last war. And the Germans totally surprised the French by bypassing that and going through Belgium which was not, not protected. And when the war started, within three weeks, they were in Paris. Mm -hmm. And then we, we had to go to, to the south. One of the things I remember, we took a taxi from Paris to Orléans. And Orléans is a big bridge over a big river, the La Loire, and the, that bridge has been blown up. And the, there was no other way, no trains going from Paris to the south. So we took a taxi, this I remember, and from the other side we went to the south. We stayed in Issoudun. Issoudun was a town where my father, my father was a traveling salesman, I'm sorry, I'm opening <laughs> parentheses, was a uh, traveling salesman and he represented manufacturers of leather goods, mostly uh, women handbags and uh, wallets and uh, things like that. And the manufacturer were in that little town, East Sudan. We went there. We stayed there a few, uh, a few good months. And we are three families together, mm -hmm. of my, my family. My, uh, <clears throat> and we are three in the same class. My, my, my cousin, Aimé, my cousin, Hélène. And <laughs> we, of course, uh, told everybody, told the parents of all the bad things the other one did at school. It was uh, <laughs> So you, you were in Isidon for just several months. Several and months. You were, able to, you were able to go to school while went, you were there. Yeah, well, how many months, I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, short we went, we went to school for us. Tell us, um, Alex, um, when, you, when you were in Paris and, and of course, fled once the, mm -hmm. the Germans invaded and, and, and mm -hmm. occupied Paris, um, your father had... You lived in an apartment, and your mm -hmm. father paid for several years in advance. He paid in, until 1943, mm -hmm. and he stopped paying because in, we left the apartment, we left all the furniture in, and uh, until, I think, August 1943, when uh, the authorities, I think the French, uh, sealed the apartment, took all the furniture out, then my father stopped paying. After the war, when we came back, I mean, I anticipated... We'll talk about that later, yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. So he, it was unoccupied for several years, and he, was, he had paid rent on... He paid the rent, rent, yeah. So after, after a period of time, a short period of time, a few months perhaps in Isadan, that's when your parents decided to go to Villefranche. Yes. So you moved to Villefranche. What... Say a little bit more about why they chose to leave the Sudan and go to Villefranche. I think we wanted to go away from the what would be occupied. So farther south. Yeah, farther yeah. south. The second thing, uh, my my mother's uncle was in that town in Villefranche, and he was there from almost World War One. He was World there okay. for a long, long, long time. You, you explained to me that when you, when you got to Villefranche, that essentially you and your family lived openly in Villefranche. Yeah. How were you able to do that? Were you not worried about as Jews being denounced? Well, I was a child then. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there were some uh, 20 or 25, I always say I have to count exactly, but <laughs> uh, 20, 25 uh, Jewish families and uh, the population was not hostile. They knew we were Jewish. Mm -hmm. Once or twice, I heard, oh, le petit juif, the little Jew, Jew boy. But uh, that was it. I, I know for sure I did not miss one day of school. Mm -hmm. Now, once or twice, 
we had to go under the radar. Uh, I remember my sister and me, we spent a few nights at the science teacher's house. Now, for me, it was an adventure. It was a sleepover. Uh, the real reason, I never had the curiosity to ask. The immediate reason, I guess there was a warning. Uh, it's a mystery to me, to that day, how my aunt and... Well, my father was not there. was a traveling. And uh, there is still a mystery where my aunt was. Maybe at a good friend of her. She had two, three good friends. But uh, I tell you, for me, it was a, a sleepover. You shared with me um, the, that one of the memories you have of, um, of sleeping over at your science teacher's house is that he had um, comic books or cartoons that, oh. that, that, that mocked yeah. the Germans, I think. Yeah, he had cartoons, but they were, um, they were political cartoons. And uh, the cartoons talked about two, uh, two population, two group of two population. One population was the Botellas. Now, Botellas, you have the word boot in it, meaning the Italians, because Italy looks like a boot. And the, the other were the capellos. The capellos mean the hat, the helmet. And Germany looked more or less like a helmet. This I remember from the book. So they were and political we, cartoons yeah. about the Italians. And we had also, I, I, I did notice that before, we had also some uh, poems who were written in, had two different meanings depending the order on which you read the, you read the lines. I mean, if you read straight, you had four verses, blank, four verses, four verses, blank, four verses. If you read from top to bottom, and then second row from, bo uh, from uh, top to bottom, it has one meaning. And if you read across, and then across, it had a totally different meaning. There are some tricks, and of course the whole thing was uh, uh, to express uh, an anti-Nazi sentiments, feelings. Yes, Alex, your your mother had been diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. before the war began, but mm -hmm. she passed away in May 1941 when yes. you were just eight years old. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you remember about the loss of your mother. What I remember vaguely is a, f a few days she was with us. We, we had a very small apartment in villefranche de rouergue What I remember is that in her last days, she, her face was kind of twisted. And she used... Our, her youngest sister, Tzili, was living with us. She came first uh, to live with us to take care of her older sister, of my mother. And uh, she used to call her uh, every night when she was in pain to help her, etc. And one night she didn't call. And she, that night she, she passed away. Now, I would, didn't go. She was buried in another town in Toulouse. And uh, I didn't go to the burial. They kept me in Villefranche. And I remember my aunt, uh, she kind of, uh, she sealed the door and the windows to, uh, to disinfect. This I remember the, what she do. There is another name for that, but I forgot. Uh, to, clean the, to clean the room, etc. There's a, a few things I remember from her. In, very little. And your Aunt Celie would become very important in your life. Tell, yeah. us, a, tell us a little bit about her. Well, uh, almost my surrogate mother. Right. Almost. Uh, meaning she was with us. I always had a special relationship with my aunt. and uh, So much that my sister protested. Uh, Madeleine protested. She said one day, she said quite, uh, because my my aunt was kind of authoritarian. 
and my sister was a teenager, 14, 15, and she didn't accept the, the authority. And one day my sister screamed at me, said, she's not your mother. But uh, I had a special relationship with her because of uh, that. Alex, yeah. um, after your mother's death, you, you went to a camp, mm -hmm. and there you encountered an anti-Semitic camp director. Mm -hmm. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about yes. that? Yes. I went actually twice to youth camp, to Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts camp. The first, I don't remember many things. The second one, these camps were with another group of Cub Scouts from another city. And the, the counselor, the head of the camp, was from the other city. And he, he summoned me the first day, me and one or two other, one I remember for sure, maybe two. And he said, these ones, we are Jewish. I don't want them. Then came the, uh, the, his deputy, Monsieur Yesh, I remember his name, who was the math teacher in my school for higher grades. He said, they go, I go. That was the end of the story. He stayed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, remarkable. Yeah, but uh, usually... Uh, signs of anti-Semitism we didn't see once you know, maybe you will ask later about the Croatians. Oh, that, this, would be a, this would be a very good time. Okay, so in my town was, uh, there was a, a battalion of uh, German soldiers which in fact were Croatians. They were not German, they were Croatians. And they were serving in the, in the military. And part of the Croatians one day uh, rebelled against their officers. They killed the officers and they, uh, they said that uh, Villefranche was the first town to be liberated. Uh, needless to say, the Germans sent reinforcement and uh, the whole rebellion was quelled within a few hours, not even days. Now, I, was, I crossed the town at that time, and here and there I could hear some shooting, and at some place of the town, <clears throat> at some sites, I saw a body covered with uh, blankets. These were the, that, uh, that rebellion was quelled. Uh, well, oh yeah. Now, the German put curfew on the town. They put posters explaining the curfew in German and in French. And in the poster, the last line said, don't be influenced by the Brits and the Jews. So we saw the Jews say, maybe we should uh, go under the radar. Go. And we decided to leave the town for a couple of days. My sister and me, we left first. Uh, because my sister had a student, uh, <clears throat> a student ID with, without a stamp Jew. Now, my aunt and her best friend, they was a, she was an Italian refugee, left, I mean, they went across the roadblock a few minutes later, and uh, I don't know to this day what kind of paper my, my aunt had, silly had, I don't know. But uh, so when they went to the check post, they explained to the soldier there that they were caught by the curfew and they lived here, just behind this little hill. And they let them go. So we went uh, to the next train station, took the train, three more stations, three more stops, and went to the woods where I had, uh, my parents had a relative, a cousin, he was living literally in the woods, and his, uh, his living was to make charcoal. So we went back, we went to him, and after, the problem was that my father was a traveling salesman. He took the train Monday morning, and we knew exactly his itinerary, so we went to the, 
when we went in the woods, we went to the nearest train station. The train arrived. The train stops two minutes. There's no time to jump in the cars and go through the train. And then the train started to pull out and call it as a, a miracle if you want. Suddenly my father appeared at the window. So we ran after the train. These are steam trains. You can run after them. And uh, we shouted to him, Daddy, go down. Descend à la prochaine. Go down at the next uh, station. What he did. And he joined us. I suppose that at home he would have found a note or something. Alex, yeah. probably we should uh, explain for our audience that, that when you had gone to Villefranche originally, that was Vichy, France. It was the unoccupied portion. Mm -hmm. yeah. By the time that this, the Croatian mutiny happened, the Germans had now I occupied yeah, all occupied of France. France yes. so, so you were, you no longer had even the little security you might have felt mm -hmm. um, when the Germans hadn't yeah. occupied it. Now they were there in full force. Yeah, now they were there. Uh, actually, the Germans came twice. Mm -hmm. They came at the very beginning of the, of the war, and then they retreated, mm -hmm. and then they came later uh, to occupy. For the, the first occupation was two-thirds of France, including all the Atlantic coast. The second time, they occupied the whole thing to the Mediterranean. Your, your father, as you mentioned, was a traveling salesman. He continued to do that mm -hmm. even uh, while you were in Villefranche, when the Germans occupied mm -hmm. yeah. Vichy France. That must have been considerable risk for him to for be him, traveling yes. around. Yes, my father had, we were all French, my father had a French ID with a big stamp Jew, Schwif, meaning he could have been controlled, and he was controlled twice, he told me, he told us. Uh, he could have been controlled and vanished, being arrested and vanished. It didn't happen. I know that he was controlled. So when he took the train uh, Monday morning, there was no guarantee we'll see him on Friday. It must have been very... Yeah must have been very uh, stressful, if not terrifying, for him to yeah. take those risks. I, I, I want to say something. As Frenchmen, we were more or less protected in the town where we were. Across the street was a Jewish-Polish family, Stocky family. They had three sons who were in school with me. And uh, one day they vanished. I checked at the Holocaust Memorial in Paris a few weeks, a few, two, three years ago. They, I found their names, and uh, when I went to the archive, they told me that they didn't survive. They were just across the street. And, and they were not French citizens? They were not French. They were not French citizens. They were not French. And yet, even with a French citizenship, you still could have been, your father and family... My father could have been, could have been taken. Uh, my... Tante Tzili, who was not French, it's a little bit of a mystery just because I didn't ask right. how she survived uh, during the war. And she was very, I know that she was very reluctant to talk about that period. Uh, Alex, you, you lived under those circumstances for, for you know, several years and then shortly after the D-Day invasion, which took place, of course, in June 1944, mm -hmm. a German armored, armored unit passed through your town, mm -hmm. firing shells indiscriminately into the town. Tell us what you remember of that, and, and, and when did you believe that the war was coming to an end for your family? Um, yeah. Because that was after the Normandy invasion. Uh, after Normandy, the Normandy invasion took place in June Four, or June 6, six, six, yeah, June six. June 6, 1944. This is where the four comes from. <laughs> 1944. And uh, we heard about it by word of mouth. I don't think we heard it by radio. Word of mouth. And of course, there was big excitement. The Allies are coming. Mm -hmm. 
les alliés ont débarqué, we say they disembarked. And, but south of us was an SS division, armored division, and they were rushed to the front. And here and there, not in our town, but here and there, when they saw a nice house in the countryside, they made target practice on it, a few houses. Now, they, on the way up, they uh, perpetrated a massacre, which we learned only much later, uh, in a small town, they went across the town there where they thought there was some French underground there. It was not true, it was just a mix up of uh, names. And they killed the whole population, they destroyed the village, they set the church on fire. One woman succeeded to escape and she told the story. Now they put the townspeople into that church. Yes, yes, they put the, the, the men yep. in that. No, they put the women and children into the, the men, they put them in bonds and they gunned them down. Now, after, uh, so one woman succeeded to escape and she told the story. After the war, Charles de Gaulle, who was the president of France, decided to keep that, that town as it was. So I always say my visitors upstairs, <laughs> if you go to France and you don't have much better to do, it's about four hours drive from Paris. You, it's a ghost town. To this day. Yeah, this and day. I, said, I say always to the ladies, you might go there because it's not far from Limoges. And Limoges is where the French uh, ceramics are. So you might be attracted by that. Alex, um, you, you, you told me that then one day the Germans just disappeared. They were just mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little more about that and then what, what happened once the Germans were gone and you were, in a sense, free to do what you wanted. What, what happened then? I don't know, we, we, we felt being free. And uh, I, I don't remember exactly by the, what happened. I know that we knew that the Germans were gone. We knew that they were, they were evacuating. What I do remember is at the end of the war, at the end of the war, in my town, there were many refugees from Alsace and from Lorraine. And when France was liberated, all these people traveled back. The war was not over, but they traveled back to Lorraine and to Alsace, and they were drunk <laughs> impossible, but they were, uh, they boarded the train singing and the, the whole, uh, I mean, it was a whole show, I remember that. And as you said, the war wasn't over. France was liberated in September 44, mm -hmm. yeah. but of course the war didn't end until May of 1945, so at any point I imagine people were fearful that the Germans might come back. Yeah, but uh, we, we learned, I mean, I was a boy and I could not uh, follow exactly what was happening. But don't forget, this is the period, the period where there was the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge, which was uh, the German counterattack in Bastogne. And they surrounded the American 82nd Airborne Division. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, George Patton, with the third American army was directed toward was directed toward Germany, and he disengaged, and uh, he put the, put his troop to the north to disenclave the 82nd uh, Airborne. There were some famous words at that time. The German offered to the 82nd Airborne to surrender, and the American surrendered. The American general said, nuts, <laughs> to the, as that was his answer. Nuts, yeah. Yeah, right. Nuts. That is famous. Um, Alex, while, while, of course, uh, with the war over, uh, you, your father, your sister, your mm -hmm. aunt Silly, you all survived the war and the Holocaust, but, but many of your family members did, did not. not. Tell us about yeah. some of your family members. We, we had uh, my grandparents were still in that little town in 
Poland, Ukraine. And uh, we used to get letters from them because being under the same rule, the postal service was working. So we could get letters and postcards. And I remember two letters we got. One said, don't send parcels with food. The parcels arrive empty. They are stolen on the way. And the second said, in, that was in April, I think, 43. Maybe I mixed up. No, not April. It was in August, but uh, I don't remember exactly which year. They said, we leave. We don't know where we are going. We know exactly. They were marched to a nearby forest, my grandfather and my grandmother on my mother's side. They were marched to a nearby forest. They were told to undress, and they were gunned down in a trench. We know that exactly by people who succeeded to escape. They didn't succeed. So, Alex, yeah. you, you, had a, you told me about a cousin of yours who had um, actually joined the French resistance, mm -hmm. but he was, he was caught by the Nazis. What happened to him? Oh, that my cousin... Lucien. Lucien was a MD, medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And he had a little clinic for wounded resistant people. And uh, he, as a doctor, with the oath of Hippocrates, he couldn't leave his patients. And he was caught with them, and they beat him, and they, he explained that. He spoke per perfect German. He came from Strasbourg, he knew perfectly German, and uh, they wouldn't have it, they just killed him. And, and, and when they killed him, if I remember right, that was one day before his town was liberated. Is that yeah, one or two days. One something. or two days before yeah. liberation. Mm -hmm. That was in the town of Périgueux, if somebody knows so, where it is. So right up to the area, and they were still executing yeah. uh, people. Yeah. As you said, massacred that, that village. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and tell us about, you had another cousin, Zeph. Ah. Zev Gottesman. Zev Gottesman was a cousin of my, first cousin of my mother. And Zev Gottesman was a communist. He was an idealist for the communist idea. And he fought before the war in the Spanish war. He, was, he fought on the, uh, the anti-Franco war. And when the... <clears throat> Uh, this, this army was defeated, he, pa he went to France, and he joined the underground, and uh, he, was, uh, he brought his two children to my town and came back to the, to the resistance, and he was killed in the liberation of Toulouse. I remember exactly when we, when we got the news. I remember exactly. You also shared with me... Um, your father had a brother who had stayed in Poland, mm -hmm. and he survived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell my, us. My father, they had, there were five brothers. The last one, the youngest one, stayed in Poland during the war, and he survived. Whether his children survived, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And after the war, he went to reclaim his watch to a Ukrainian peasant to reclaim his watch. I, gave, I guess he gave his watch for, you know, in the Jewish tradition in these days, you, when somebody was bar mitzvah, you gave him a golden watch. That was the tradition. Mm -hmm. And I suppose he gave his watch to get some food or to get some money or something. When he came back to reclaim his watch, the peasant murdered him. That was two, two years after the war. Two years after the war. Mm -hmm. yeah. with, with the war over in May of 1945, five, five years after the invasion of France, what did your father do to, to rebuild his life? What, and, and what happened to you? How did you kind of get started again after all that you'd been through? Well, we, can, we came back to Paris. Moved back to Paris. And uh, my father was offered an apartment, but not his. 
and for sentimental reasons and also financial because he had paid the rent and in October 43 we went, by, we went by, back in 45 he wanted his own apartment what has been his apartment and after a big uh, legal battle he got it and then he had to, to rebuild his, uh, his clients and uh, he, was, he, was, he was not old. My father came back in, when we came back in 49, in 45, my, my father was 50. 50 is not old. I'm 84. <laughs> 50 is not old. And uh, he, but he was worn out. He was worn out. And one of the signs he was worn out. Before the war, he wanted to study French. He wanted to know good French. And after the war, he couldn't care less. And he only came back to himself a little bit when my sister got married and she had two, two daughters. Then my father started kind of. Now my father had also an unruly son. It was me. <laughs> I studied in France, and in France you can have a, defer a, defermer, a deferment for going to the military. I got that deferment, and after the deferment was over, after my studies were over and the deferment was over, I didn't show up to the French army. Instead, I went to Israel, and I served in the Israel Defense Forces. But... Uh, it's a violation in France. If you don't show up, you, I had a trial in abstentia, as we say in... Uh, Do you like think of you as a deserter? Is yeah. that what they say? Uh, that? No. Deserter is somebody who's in, 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 in the yeah. army and runs away. Yeah. But in your case... I you didn't, didn't show up. <laughs> it's a, no, no. It's a, legally, it's a great difference. Yes. Anyway, legally or not, I got one year jail. I was not there, and uh, confiscation of all my belongings. I had no belongings. That was not a problem. So I, uh, so I went to Israel. I served in the IDF, and uh, France has a nice tradition that when a new president uh, is uh, inaugurated, uh, usually there is a widespread amnesty for small to medium infractions. And not to show up was a medium infraction. And uh, actually, I missed the first uh, amnesty. I missed Pompidou. And uh, I had to wait another seven years until Giscard d'Estaing was uh, elected. Then I grabbed it. And after this, I, can, I could come back to France. Actually, I want to come back to you to a little bit about your military service in Israel, but um, I, I want to go back to one thing that you shared with me that I, I'd like you to talk about. Um, you had an Uncle Max at the end mm -hmm. of the war yeah. who had a radio, and mm -hmm. on the radio they would broadcast the names yeah. of people who were returning from mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the camps and other places. T tell us a little you know, bit about my that. I used to call it my Uncle Max. In fact, he was an uncle of my, of my mother. But at that age, 10, 11, I could go to my Uncle Max, who was our next door neighbor. I could go, uh, I just knocked at the door and I came in. And one day after the, war, after the war, I go in. They had a radio and uh, his wife was listening and sobbing very quietly. She was sobbing because she had a son, Armand. And Armand was killed at the beginning of World War II, fighting the Germans in the French army, fighting the Germans. And the radio was broadcasting all the names of the French POW who were coming back home. And of course, her son was not coming back. So she was sobbing there. I remember quite vividly that. Uh, yeah. that Alex, um, yeah. Um, so when when you when you moved to Israel, you joined mm -hmm. the Israeli military. Um, t 
tell, tell us about your experience in the Israeli military. Yeah, it, the exp experience is, uh, first of all, they say, we always say in Israel, the military is a melting pot. That's true. I met, I was what we call an Ashkenazi, I met Central Europe, European Jewish boy, and I knew Sephardic from North Africa. But I never met, once, once a Saturday, I woke up in the morning, and there were people, uh, soldiers, playing backgammon, you might know the game, backgammon, and listening to radio full volume with oriental music. I woke up, I thought I was in a pub in somewhere in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. These were the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. I never met Iraqis, Jewish people before. I never met also <coughs> Yemenites. Yemenites are usually a little bit darker face, and they, are, they speak Hebrew, pure Hebrew. With, in Hebrew, you have a few guttural uh, consonants, ein and het. And they, they used to they pronounce Hebrew with that accent. But they were hard-working people. I served in artillery, and in artillery, being a good Frenchman, we had to, to dig positions and to put at night, and we put the gun at the end in the position. It has to be about a meter da deep, where you put the gun in, and uh, that's the end of your work. Well, being from uh, my ascent, we tried here and there to cut corners, of course. It's a, it's a hard job, but you know, you have only a, a pick and a shovel, and you, you, you do your job with that. Yemenites were the first to finish. They did not straighten up until the gun was down, ready to shoot. That was my encounter with the Yemenites. Later on, I saw them also in other occasions, but... That was my encounter with them. Alex, before we turn to our audience to ask if they have some questions mm -hmm. of you, tell us, tell us what became of your Aunt Silly. What happened to Aunt Silly after the war? You know, ah, as you yeah. said, she'd been a, a surrogate mother for you. <laughs> yeah, she was on one hand, she was a surrogate mother. She didn't want to talk about, about the war. My aunt was Polish. I don't know what kind of papers she had during the war. She lived with us. She was almost my kind of my surrogate mother. But, and after the war, she didn't want to talk about that. What I know is, what I remember, is after the war, she wanted to get the French uh, citizenship. So she had to study to pass an exam of what they call was not school leaving exam but an exam of a test of general French culture. And I remember she took private lessons in fr uh, philosophy and French literature for a good couple of months. And then she took that test. And once she became French, she had to test. She, uh, uh, she wa went to dentist school, dental school, in Strasbourg, which was France, but she couldn't, uh, she had to repass the last, to retake <clears throat> the last test of dentistry, and then she could work. Then she could, uh, she started to work with the Jewish children, and then she opened her own practice. When did she pass away? Uh, that's a good question. I don't remember. You remember? I don't know. A, a, good, a good few years ago, I remember one thing. She was very old. Mm -hmm. She's the one who passed away the oldest. She was 90, a few weeks short of 93. And I planned to go to Israel 
to, not to Israel, to France, to wish her 93rd birthday until my sister called and said, Alex, too late. That was a few weeks before, before I went. I think I still have the ticket somewhere, the air, the air, the air ticket. Alex, you had this um, amazing uh, career, I think, in agriculture that took you took you okay. all over the world. Yeah. I mean, places that to mm -hmm. most of us sound very exotic, Madagascar yeah. and all kinds of places. Then you came to the United States, and in 2013, you became a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. Tell us some, what was sort of the, 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 the pushed most motive, what pushed you to say, I'm going to go get this done now? What was it? Two things. Okay. One was the <clears throat> there was a uh, hundred years to the musician Guthrie. Woody, I don't know, Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie. I don't know who was the father, who was the son, but never mind. One was hundred years to Woody Guthrie. And at the last the last song, I was the audience was packed at the Kennedy Center and the last song all the performers were on aligned on stage and all the audience was standing singing this is my country this is your country from california to the uh, new york island new york island etc yeah. that was one thing you don't want me to sing <laughs> 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 and the second thing was shoot <laughs> the name the, the day after the inauguration of the uh, September 11 memorial at the Pentagon, I went to visit it. You could not visit the day of the inauguration because it was an official day and uh, only official people could go there. I went the next day and so I saw the September 11 and then I went to the, uh, the Air Memorial, to the Air Force Memorial, which is just behind. You know, it's that memorial where you see the three spikes coming toward the, the, the sky. And I went there, and uh, I looked at Washington, and I have a kind of sentiment, a kind of feeling, this is the land of the free. And then next day, I lodged, uh, uh, and I surprised my wife, <laughs> a request to become an American citizen. That was the next day, yeah. which I got within four or five months. Four or five I took, months. Uh, took some time. Well, Alex, thank you for that. I think we have time for some questions from our audience. Yeah. We have uh, microphones in the aisle. If you have a question, we ask that you wait till you have a microphone. Try to make the question as brief as you can. I'll do my best to repeat the question just to be sure that we hear it, and then Alex will respond to your question. Um, so we have Mike. So uh, anybody um, uh, are willing to, to or have a question they want to ask? And I, I will also mention that when Alex is finished, he's going to remain here on the stage, and that will also be an opportunity for you to come yeah, up and ask somebody. Alex other questions. And if you don't have questions, I can ask a bunch, but am I seeing a hand go up? No. Just a yawn, just a yawn. Okay. <laughs> All right, we have a question right here in the front. We'll bring you a mic. Here, here it comes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good night. Um, Good, what made you want to come to the U.S. in the first place? Excuse me? What made you want to come to the United States in the first place? Oh. It's yep. To move stand, here. Yep. Stands in two words. My wife. <laughs> We were, we met in Haiti. I worked for the United Nations. Amy worked for the American school as a school counselor. And we met on a very auspicious day, according to the Jewish calendar. That day was the day of Purim. Purim is the Jewish carnival. But Purim, in Hebrew, is linked to the fate. Poor is the fate. So uh, we went together to three, uh, to three uh, different developing countries. The last one was Haiti. And then Amy 
it said stop. By then we were married, we had a child, and uh, she said stop, you go to Haiti, I go to the United States to pursue a doctor degree. And this brought her to the George Washington University here. And 18 months later, I came. When I, I mean, I was, I was used to, to shuttle when, when I had a long, uh, a long weekend. I could, could come from Haiti and see the family. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Merci beaucoup. Oh, il <laughs> n'y a pas de quoi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have quoi, one over here. Yeah, il n'y a pas de quoi is de nada, but in French. <laughs> what was it like knowing that any time during the war, you or your family members could be captured or killed? What, what was it like for you, Alex, to know that at any point during the war, you and your or your family could have been captured and killed? What was that like for you as a kid? What do you remember feeling? I must say, at that age, I didn't feel any danger. I didn't feel any danger. I, I didn't miss one day of school. This is sure. We went to the countryside in the summer, whether it was to run away from something or just a vacation, I guess it was just for a vacation. I mean, the only time we decided to go under the radar, or beside the two or three nights we spent at the uh, science teacher, I went to summer camp with the uh, Cub Scouts, and uh, we went to the countryside for <clears throat> we went to um, f for the summer. I don't know if it was a vacation. It was. I guess it was. Now, there is another thing here. My <clears throat> mother's elder brother had a, a little factory to, pro to manufacture belts, belts for pants. And he brought all, all his machines all his equipment from Strasbourg to the little town where we were. And he opened his workshop. He was working there, cutting leather and etc. Until one day, he got a letter from some admiral in Toulon. And that admiral said, the Jew, Wolf Fried, that was his name, is not authorized to have to own a workshop or a factory or business. Okay, so my uncle made a fictitious sale to a friend of his and uh, went on. Then we got a second letter. The Jew, Wolf Fried, Cannot, is not authorized to work in his previous uh, factory. To this day, I wonder how they came to know it. Maybe somebody in Villefranche was not exactly happy with him and uh, denounced him. I don't know. Then my uncle had to sell his stuff. And then he went to the countryside. My, my, his son, my cousin, was always in boarding school all these years. And my uncle went to the countryside. And I learned only much later that he became uh, in charge of an ammunition uh, dep depot for the French underground. But I don't know any detail about that. And today there is nobody to ask about that. Maybe I could find it, Google something. Well, yeah. Well, well, I think we're at the end of our time. Um, I want to. We're going to hear again from um, Alex in just a moment. But I want to thank all of you for being with us. Uh, we will have um, five more programs this year until August 9th, each Wednesday and Thursday. Um, if you can't come back, all of our programs are on the museum's YouTube page. So please. Um, uh, Take some of those in if you can if you can possibly do that, and we will resume again in March of 2019.
it's um, our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. So I'll turn back to Alex to close our program. And as I mentioned a moment ago, when Alex is finished, he will remain here on the stage. Mm -hmm, yeah. We invite anybody who would like to come up and uh, shake his hand, get a picture taken with him, ask him a question if you didn't have a chance to do so. So please take advantage of that, if you will. So on that, I turn it over yeah. to Alex. Okay. Thank you for giving me the, half, the last word. It doesn't happen every day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I want to say, last time you asked that, I made a very big uh, uh, <clears throat> last word saying that uh, Israel will always, uh, <clears throat> will always live, etc. Today I'm thinking about this institution, the Holocaust Museum. I work twice a week as a volunteer on the at the visitor services. And when I see classes, school, school students coming and all the youngsters, I always told them, tell them, you tell your friends what you saw here. You tell your friend that you saw here. Because many people, as far as we, times progresses, when times progresses, people, uh, there is more and more a sentiment that uh, it was not that terrible. It was. I always say that to my audience. It was. You spread the word as it, that it was. Last summer or two summers ago, I went to Poland with my son. I went to Krakow. Krakow is a very nice city, and in Krakow you still feel the soul of Karol Wojtyla. You know who is Karol Wojtyla? Somebody knows? Pope John Paul II. He was from Krakow. But 30 miles from Krakow, you have Auschwitz and Birkenau. Auschwitz, Birkenau are two camps, walking distance. In Auschwitz, you still see the gas chambers, you still see the crematoria, you see the pit where they uh, threw the ashes. When you go to uh, ah, the other kind, Birkenau, when you go to Birkenau, Birkenau is a camp, nothing is left at Birkenau of the barracks, only one barrack is left. Uh, but you see, the, you see where the barracks stood, and uh, Birkenau is a camp where one and a half million people were murdered. This is Birkenau. Now, the Nazis tried to hide a little bit, so in Birkenau, they blew up the crematoria, and they blew up the gas chamber, but you feel it. And when you stand on the, you can stand on the same uh, platform, where people were coming in. And that same platform is a little bit sim symbolized in this building. At once, uh, when you go up the stairs uh, to the second floor, the stairs, you have a little bit of that same view. That was the platform where the SS officer was sitting at the table and he looked at you, and he looked at you, and he looked at you, didn't, didn't talk. This was gas chamber. This was slave labor. But you didn't know it. This was, and when you go there, you still feel it. You feel, and if, if all this was not enough, at Birkenau, they had punishment cells. You see them today. It's kind of cells in the, dug in the, of concrete, uh, down, stay, down, and they let prisoners stay there for hours. And also another place where they kept prisoners in very, very, very uncomfortable uh, position. 
So you go home, you spread the word, and as we say here, we hope never again. Although, unfortunately, it's happening. Another thing which we say never again is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism today is uh, under the guise of anti-Israel. But make no mistake, it's anti-Semitism. And we have, to, we have to fight against that. We have to fight against that. Uh, many times we find the press is under, may find, many times we find the uh, uh, media are against, a little bit television, uh, especially, you know, the, <clears throat> ah, the internet, the world of the internet, you find many, many things again. Okay, so, thank you very much. And thank you very much.